The first thing to understand with this video is that the majority of things taking place today, especially most of the things that people complain about, is being done under the pretense of voided and null contracts. There's no legitimacy to essentially, in most cases, any of the activities that continue to go on today. This is a situation of let's pretend. And in most circumstances where people receive something, which in the mail or in person, which is based off of these voided or null contracts, that affords, or the knowledge of that affords a appropriate response. You get a debt collection in the mail, you can write on it, this is based off of a voided contract or this contract is voided, or whatever you want to say. There is no contract, essentially. That's what a voided or null contract means. It's gone, doesn't exist, not enforceable anymore. Of course, this takes on a different uh, set of circumstances, shall we say, when it comes to fraudulent fees or fake taxes from all the different incorporated municipalities, incorporated, stipulating that there's probably a contract for that incorporation, that we call cities. We call cities incorporated municipalities or we call incorporated municipality, municipality cities. Yeah, that's how we do it. And a lot of them are enforcing edicts and acts under voided and null contracts. Essentially, they have no legitimacy or authority to do what they're doing under any pretense whatsoever. Except they continue doing it. And most people don't know how to respond because they don't understand that the direct response would be to let them know that this is an unenforceable and voided contract. Of course, you have to know that in order to say that. Now, there are other, many other actions that should and need to be taken as this regards uh, acting under false pretense, fraud, and voided contracts, and those perpetrating it. But the general concept of understanding should be around the fact that every city incorporated municipality, every incorporated state government, most of these large giant corporations, and the majority of land sale purchases and contracts for uh, renters contracts, for instance, or any of these other ones, well, they were all voided. Can't be enforced. Now, I don't know exactly know where we might go from here, but I do know that entities going around acting under the pretense of voided contracts is a very interesting situation. Before I get into the content in this video, I'm going to briefly describe the apparent implications of what is contained within it. Essentially, there are groups of individuals across the entire nation who are continuing to act under the authority of voided, of null and voided contracts or agreements. Those individuals are called licensed attorneys. Some call them bar card holders, but that's not particularly important to the context of this video. Nearly every group across the nation instantly goes to their quote unquote legal counsel. Those are your licensed attorneys. All of those individuals are acting under voided contracts. They have no ability, authority, or any other pretense to continue working in the capacities that they are working still in. They are operating under voided contracts. All of those individuals engaged in fraud and other crimes, every single one, is doing so willfully and knowledgeably. These are very important. Of course, the importance of this video is how the information can be used at the local level by individuals and private persons who might not otherwise understand what's going on. Well, this can be, this information anyway, can be used against all the various entities across the nation who are currently committing 
all sorts of heinous acts against the local communities. Those include, of course, the city councils. Those include all of the real estate companies. They include all of the people who are driving up prices on commodities and everything else they're doing, because all of them are doing it under generally fraudulent pretense, but specifically at the behest of licensed attorneys acting on voided contracts. So let's say that, for instance, a, to use a dramatic example, a police officer shows up at your door and they have a warrant. That warrant is going to be signed and issued by a licensed attorney, or at some case, they will be involved. Take a look at that and say it's illegitimate. It, you can let it can say all kinds of things. It doesn't matter which one you say. Also, if you're in a negotiation, in a board meeting, or if you're dealing with these people, they will go and say, I need to uh, adhere to my legal counsel or go consult with my legal counsel. Their legal counsel, of course, cannot exist because that means they're going to go and talk to a licensed attorney practicing under voided authority. When you understand this, you can target the attorneys in every organization across the country, in every government, in every locality. You can target them specifically because they are willful and knowledgeable in the actions that they're taking. They know they're operating under voided authority, fraudulently taken, and telling others to do the same. Every single attorney in every local jurisdiction, in every city, in every town, in every company, in every place, every single one that has not instantly vacated their office and left practice completely under their attorney license is committing a willful and knowledgeable crime. So, in order to explain this concept in its nitty gritty, I suppose, to an extent, we'll look at the force majeure concept. In contract law, according to Wikipedia, force majeure is a common clause in contracts which essentially frees both parties from liability or obligation with an extraordinary event or circumstance beyond the control of the parties, such as a war, strike, riot, crime, epidemic, or sudden legal change prevents one or both parties from filling their obligations under contract. Now, I covered this concept in the video titled Major Force, or Force Majeure. And essentially speaking, when a contract is voided under Force Majeure, it cannot then be followed. It has a new contract has to be written and renegotiated. So you can't have a company which contracts to build a building somewhere. And then there's a natural event, some sort of destructive force comes in, something else that makes it impossible for them to complete that construction, their contract is voided. After that event has then been moved or removed, taken care of, they cannot then go in and construct that edifice under the original contract. They have to make a new one. However, what we see going on today is the opposite. You have a large number of individuals continuing, continuing under old contracts that were voided. Now, many people can claim state of mind, mens rea as a defense, but certain individuals in our society cannot. Again, okay, according to Wikipedia, void, void contract. A contract is an agreement enforceable by law. A void agreement is one, notice that word agreement, which cannot be enforced by law. Sometimes an agreement which is enforceable by law, i.e. a contract, can become void. Void agreements are different from voidable contracts, which are contracts that may be nullified. However, when a contract is being written and signed, there is no automatic mechanism available to every situ in every situation that can be utilized to detect the validity or enforceability of that contract. Practically, a contract can be declared to be void by a court of law. That's a general term, by the way, a court of law. There are many types of courts of different laws, whatnot. An agreement to carry out an illegal act is an example of a void agreement. For example, an agreement between drug dealers and a buyer is a void agreement simply because the terms of the contract are illegal. Well, if they're in writing, then technically they're, they're legal, but I'm not going to get into that. In such a case, neither party can go to court to enforce the contract. Well, they might be able to go to certain courts, 
you know, like the uh, alleged mafioso commission of New York could have been considered a court, although they wouldn't. A void agreement is a void ab initio, i.e. from the beginning, while a voidable contract can be voidable by one or all of the parties. A voidable contract is not void ab initio, rather it becomes void later due to some changes in condition. And there they sort of slightly gloss over the idea of force majeure. In sum, there is no scope of any discretion on the part of the contracting parties in a void agreement. The contracting parties do not have the power to make a void agreement enforceable. Admission to the bar in the United States, from Wikipedia. Admission to the bar in the United States is a granting of permission by a particular court system to a lawyer to practice law in the jurisdiction. Each U.S. state and jurisdiction territories under federal control has its own court system and sets its own rules and standards for bar admission. In most cases, a person is admitted or called to the bar of the highest court in the jurisdiction and is thereby authorized to practice law in the jurisdiction. Federal courts, although often overlapping in admission standards with states, set their own requirements. Typically, lawyers seeking admission to the bar of one of the U.S. states must earn must earn a Juris Doctor degree from a law school approved by the jurisdiction, pass a bar exam, and professional responsibility examination, and undergo a character and fitness evaluation, with some exceptions to each requirement. A lawyer admitted in one state is not automatically allowed to practice in any other. Some states have reciprocal agreements that allow attorneys from other states to practice without sitting for another's bar exam. So there we get their first instance of that word, use of that word, agreement, otherwise known as a contract. Formal admission. Once all prerequisites have been satisfied, an attorney must formally apply for admission. The mechanics of this final stage vary widely. For example, in California, the admittee simply takes an oath before any state judge or notary public, who then co-signs the admission form. Upon receiving the signed form, the State Bar of California adds the new admittee to a list of applicants recommended for admission to the bar which is automatically ratified by the Supreme Court of California at its next regular weekly conference. Then everyone in the list is added to the official role of attorneys. State Bar also holds a large-scale formal admission ceremonies in conjunction with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the Federal District Courts, usually in the same convention centers where new admittees took the bar examination, but these are optional. In other jurisdictions, such as the District of Columbia, new admittees must attend a special session of court in person to take the oath of admission in open court. They cannot take the oath before any available judge or notary public. A successful applicant is permitted to practice law after being sworn in as an officer of the court. In most states, that means they may begin filing pleadings and appearing as counsel of record in any trial of appellate court in the state. Upon admission, a new lawyer is issued a certificate of admission, usually from the state's highest court, and a membership card attesting to admission. There are your contractual credentials. Two states are exceptions to the general rule of admission by the state's highest court. In New York, admission is granted by one of the state's four intermediate appellate courts, corresponding generally to the Department of Resident of the Applicant. Residence. Once admitted, however, the applicant can practice in any non-federal court in the state. In Georgia, each new attorney is admitted to practice by the Superior Court of any county, typically the county in which he or she resides or desires to practice. The new attorney, although licensed to practice in any local trial court in the state, must separately seek admission to the Georgia Court of Appeals as well as the Georgia Supreme Court. In most states, lawyers are also issued a unique bar identification number in states like California, where Authorized practice of law is a major problem. The state bar number must appear on all documents submitted by a lawyer. Military law. A service as a member of military services, Judge Advocate General's Corps, requires graduation from an ABA accredited law school, a license to practice law in any state or territory of the United States, and training at the specialized law school of one of the three military services, Judge Advocate General's Legal Center and School for the Army, Naval Justice School for the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, and the Air Force Judge Advocate General School for the Air Force. In a court-martial, the accused is always provided JAG Corps Defense Counsel at no expense to the accused, but is also entitled to retain private civilian counsel at his or her own expense. Civilian counsel must either be a member of both federal bar and a state bar, or must be otherwise authorized to practice law by recognized licensing authority and certified by the military judge as having sufficiently or sufficient familiarity with criminal law as applicable in courts martial. Licensing agreement is a contract giving someone the legal right to use a patent or trademark. When attorneys are admitted to the bar, they make a licensing 
agreement, otherwise known as a contract. Now we're going to go to the implications of the executive order number 13909 of March 18th, 2020, prioritizing and allocating health and medical resources to respond to the spread of COVID-19. Section two, priorities and allocation of medical resources. A. Notwithstanding Executive Order 13603 of March 16, 2012, National Defense Resource Preparedness. Notwithstanding means it has no standing and it is not relevant. The authority of the President conferred by Section 101 of the Act to require the performance of contracts or orders other than contracts of employment to promote the national defense over performance of any other contracts or orders such as attorney licensing contracts. To allocate material services and facilities is deemed necessary or appropriate to promote the national defense. That, of course, would also include the incorporated municipality contracts and so many others. And to implement the act in subchapter 3 of chapter 55 of Title 50, the United States Code is delegated to the Secretary of Health and Human Services with respect to all health and medical resources needed to respond to the spread of COVID-19 within the United States. All right. This paragraph is pretty convoluted and sort of difficult to uh, understand because, in my belief, it was targeted specifically at licensed attorneys. However, there's many far-reaching applications for this particular section of this particular executive order. That's because this is in relation to the invocation of emergency powers, or the Emergency Powers Act, declaring a state of public emergency. When that's done, generally, in most contracts, the force majeure concept, or clause, or if you want to say it, becomes applicable. However, this particular paragraph sends it even further specifically elevating all facilities necessary or promote, appropriate to promote the national defense. So, if it doesn't promote the national defense, it is null and void, essentially. Now, while it does say it's delegated to the Secretary of Health and Human Services with respect to all health and medical resources, it does not delegate any other things to anyone else, and the delegation of such does not void the intent behind it. It simply means it's delegated to this individual to do this particular thing with respect to this particular thing, but if they don't do it, it does not in fact mean that it will not be done by someone else if that entity or individual does not do what they're being ordered and told to do. However, it does not delegate this particular section with regard to any of the other implications of it. Or at least it doesn't overtly delegate. Mens rea in criminal law, according to Wikipedia, mens rea is the mental state of a defendant who is accused of committing a crime. Common law jurisdictions, most crimes require proof of both mens rea and actus reus before the defendant can be found guilty. So, what that's stating in Latin is the concept of knowledgeable and willful action. When somebody is knowledgeable and willful of something, they both know what they're doing and they have the will to do it. That is what you need to unequivocally, as far as most uh, practices go, condemn someone for a crime. Right? Well, every attorney would go through law school and they would understand what force majeure is in contracts. And as it regards that executive order, their licensing contracts for practicing law were null and voided. Thus, their continuance in activity is both willful and knowledgeable. And there are no attorneys across the nation who can claim lack of state of mind. Absolutely none. Because of the requirements that are necessary for them to become licensed attorneys in the first place. There are other people across the nation that might be able to explain or use mens rea as a defense. 
And there are many people today that continue to enforce and act upon criminally voided contracts, such as your city councilors and all these other people acting under the voided contracts of incorporated municipalities and whatnot. However, a lot of those people will likely claim, if ever pressed, lack of state of mind. They did not know what they were doing was wrong. There are no attorneys licensed across this nation and country that can claim that. Now, under the U.S. Code, Declaration of National Emergency by President, Publication Federal Register, Effect on Other Laws Superseding Legislation. With respect to acts of Congress authorizing the exercise during the period of national emergency of any special or extraordinary power, the President is authorized to declare such national emergency. Such proclamation shall immediately be transmitted to the Congress and published in the Federal Register. Any provisions of law conferring powers and authorities to be exercised during a national emergency shall be effective and remain in effect only when the President, in accordance with subsection A of this section, specifically declares a national emergency, and two, only in accordance with this chapter. All of those stipulations are met for the executive order, which specifically stipulated national defense or national security over all else. No law enacted after September 14, 1976 shall supersede the subchapter unless it does so in specific terms, referring to the subchapter and declaring that the new law supersedes the provisions of the subchapter. Proclamation 994 declaring a national emergency concerning the novel coronavirus COVID-19 out outbreak, administration of Donald J. Trump 2020, by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. In December 2019, a novel new coronavirus known as SARS-CoV-2, the virus, was first detected in Wuhan, Hubei Province, People's Republic of China, causing outbreaks of the coronavirus disease, COVID-19, that has now spread globally. <coughs> the Secretary of Health and Human Services, HHS, declared a public health emergency on January 31st, 2020. Under Section 319 of the Public Health Service Act 42 U.S.C. 247-D. In response to COVID-19, I have taken sweeping action to control the spread of the virus in the United States, including by suspending entry of foreign nationals seeking entry who have been physically present within the prior 14 days in certain jurisdictions where COVID-19 outbreaks have occurred, including the People's Republic of China, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Schengen Area of Europe, the federal government, along with state and local governments, have taken preventative and proactive measures to slow the spread of the virus and treat those affected, including by instituting federal quarantine for individuals evacuated from foreign nations, issuing a declaration pursuant to Section 319F3 of the Health Public Service Act, 42 U.S.C. 247-D6D, and releasing policies to accelerate the acquisition of personal protective equipment and streamline bringing new diagnostic capabilities to laboratories. On March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization announced that the COVID-19 outbreak can be characterized as a pandemic as the rates of infection continue to rise in many locations around the world and across the United States. The spread of COVID-19 within our nation's communities threatens to strain our nation's healthcare system. As of March 12, 2020, 1,645 people from 47 states have been infected with a virus that causes COVID-19. It is incumbent on hospitals and medical facilities throughout the country to assess their preparedness, posture, and prepare to surge capacity and capability. Additional measures, however, are needed to successfully contain and combat the virus in the United States. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States, by authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States of America, including Sections 201 and 301 of the National Emergencies Act, 50 U.S.C. 1601 at SEC, and consistent with Section 1135 of the Social Security Act, SSA, as amended 42 U.S.C. 1320B-5, do hereby find and proclaim that the COVID-19 outbreak in the United States constitutes a national emergency beginning March 1st, 2020. Pursuant to this declaration, I direct as follows. And the rest of that is not entirely applicable to this video. So a national emergency was declared in on March 1st, 2020. From that point, all contracts become null and void in relation to that emergency. However, because of the executive order we just read, those contracts were narrowed down to remaining in force as only being those that re relate to the promotion of national security. Everything else was made null and void under this proclamation. Under the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution, according to the 
revised document from the Congress, constitution.congress.gov. It states, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. From that period of March 1st, 2020, any singular infringement on the right to keep and bear arms was a violation of that executive order on the national defense. That's because, according to the Second Amendment, for the necessity of the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. All of these states across the nation who closed gun ranges, specifically leaving only certain ones open, who construed every word to mean I can do whatever I want as long as I leave one gun store open, or do any of these other things, all violated that executive order specifically because they were elevating voided contracts over those of national defense or the security of a free state. Now, under a different section of the Constitution, this would be uh, the one that stipulates the powers of the Congress, which should be under the first Article 1, Section 8. Uh, it states, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debt and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States, but all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. Under this section, it also stipulates to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the nation, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, and what I believe to be a revision, although it doesn't really matter in this context, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for gaining such part, governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline described by Congress. Prescribed. Alternatively, it states, no state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops, or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless actually evaded, or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. Under this section of the Constitution, Congress is not required to call out the militia. And this section requires the an act need of an actual invasion or imminent danger, such as a national emergency. When the National Emergency Proclamation was invoked, it lifted the requirement, essentially, for Congress to call it the militia. And in this context, states or the citizens within a state can do so of their own volition out of the public emergency proclamation. Now, under the Fifth Amendment, it states, no person shall be held to answer for capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. That's your kicker. Public danger. When there is public danger, you do not require the presentment or indictment of a grand jury to hold someone to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime. Also, it states, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. That's the Fifth Amendment. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, please uh, join my newly formed Discord. Like it, share it, uh, check out my other content. There are free books available at the link. And if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal, Cash App, or any of the other options available. Thank you.